Good afternoon. I'm Harold Holzer, and uh, I have the privilege of serving as the Jonathan Fanton Director of Roosevelt House, and I want to welcome you all and thank you for braving the uh, weather and joining us for this important discussion. Um, our president, Jennifer Rabb, joins me in welcoming you as well. She'll be here, I believe, shortly. Um, to welcome you to an institute that, thanks to Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt, has been part of Hunter College for half of its 150 years. As, as many of you know, uh, the house was built in 1905 as a combination Christmas and wedding present for Franklin and Eleanor, but um, more importantly for purposes of inspiring us tonight, it served as the incubator for New York State public policy when Roosevelt ran for and developed his program as governor of New York in 1928. Um, parenthetically, the close quarters here uh, with Franklin and Eleanor living on the west side of the house and Franklin's mother living on the east side of the house may have been uh, constricting enough to inspire Eleanor to leave her life of domesticity and uh, enter a public service in any way she could find to get out of the house. And uh, in fact, her mother-in-law told her to volunteer, suggested that she volunteer at the East Side Settlement Houses, where Eleanor began her extraordinary career, are you ready, as a dance instructor. And you don't think of a six foot one woman with stone marten furs as a dance instructor, but that's what she was. But for the 25 years before his election to the presidency, FDR used this house also at not only as the springboard for his uh, elections as governor and president, but prepared here, using this house as his transition headquarters, to confront the depression, unemployment, crumbling infrastructure nationwide, working upstairs in his second floor library with his brains trust to construct the foundational pillars of the New Deal. Um, one of my favorite of his public works programs, and I always wonder whether he did this to, uh, as a legacy for his mother, who stayed in this house after uh, the Roosevelts went to Washington. Uh, one of the WPA, uh, the WPA or PWA projects, I'm not sure which, was the 65th Street Transverse through Central Park, every taxi driver's favorite shortcut, right? But it amazingly increased the traffic that zoomed past his mother's house, and I always thought that was a little legacy. Maybe it was Eleanor's idea. We're proudest of all of the famous meeting that took place here on February 5th, 1933, when Frances Perkins came for her interview as she knew the offer was going to be to be Secretary of Labor, and uh, she said she would accept, she told President-elect Roosevelt, only if he committed to an aggressive plan that included child labor laws minimum wage, maximum hours, and most of all, old age pensions, something they had begun to create in New York State on a limited basis at the beginning of the Depression. So this is the building where Social Security literally was born, and that makes us very proud to work here. So today we are also the, uh, the incubator of public policy uh, in public programs and civic engagement. Today is an example. or in our undergraduate education in public policy and human rights. And today's program is reflected, reflective of that commitment to civic engagement and faculty initiatives. And I want to say how grateful I am to Professor Vivian Louie of Hunter's Urban Policy and Planning Department for conceiving and structuring this evening's discussion. And thanks to her inspiration, we could not have a more impressive group to discuss the various challenges to New York City taxi tradition, um, felicity, facility, and its drivers, of course. So we're particularly pleased to welcome uh, Javi Tariq, a former taxi driver himself, who helped found the New York Taxi Workers Alliance, now one of the largest and most formidable new immigrant workers unions in the nation. Javid, is it 17,000 members? 21,000. Oh, since he wrote his bio, it's increased. <laughs> 21,000 members, that's amazing. Also, Charles Kalmanoff, uh, 
Roosevelt House's 2019 Theodore Keel Transportation Fellow and one of the city and state's best known transportation economists and environmental advocates who helped structure congestion pricing for Governor Cuomo and the legislature last year and remains deeply involved in its implementation. Um, we will be joined shortly by Council Member Idanis Rodriguez uh, of Upper Manhattan, who is uh, not only a friend, but chairman of the New York City Council Transportation Committee. And it's always uh, a great pleasure to welcome my friend Keith Powers, who represents this very area of Manhattan and a much broader swath, including um, Midtown Manhattan, and Idanis is making his entrance just after I introduce him. But welcome, <laughs> Council Member Rodriguez. <laughs> so um, we have two members of the council here, our own Keith Powers and Councilman Rodriguez as well. Um, I will now turn the proceedings over to Professor Louie, who also directs Hunter's Asian American Studies Center. She is a specialist in tracking and analyzing the progress of immigrants and their children. She's the author of two important books, Compelled to Excellence and Keeping the Immigrant Bargain, The Costs and Rewards of Success in America. I, I always, whenever I introduce her, I think this is maybe the second or third time I've gotten to introduce her here, I always like to end by mentioning her education trifecta, uh, BA from Harvard, an MA from Stanford, and a PhD from Yale. And she teaches at Hunter best of all. So please welcome Professor Vivian Louie and our panel. Um, thank you so much for coming today. Um, so I'm Vivian Louie. I'm just going to be really brief in my opening remarks. Uh, Council Member Keith Powers, we're so delighted to have him, uh, along with all of our esteemed panelists but he has to leave at 5.30. <laughs> and so, um, so I am going to just keep it brief for now, just to thank Harold, um, President Rob, Harold's terrific staff here. I'll do more thank yous as we close. Promise you that, okay? Um, basically, I'm just gonna turn it over to Council Member Powers. He'll take the first go at it, uh, and then uh, Council Member Rodriguez will have some time to also have some back and forth with the panelists as best we can, and then we'll resume from there. All right? Does that All right. sound good? good? All right, I get to kick it off, so thank you. And, th and thank you to, to everybody from Hunter for having me. I'm City Council Member Keith Powers, and it, as mentioned, I represent the east side of Manhattan, including where we are today. My district goes from 14th Street up to 98th Street. I go as far west as Times Square, so I have a, a large swath of Manhattan, particularly that is impacted by congestion and traffic, and uh, I think was, has been at times central to this conversation about transportation and traffic and taxis and for hire vehicles. But before I say anything, and I'll be brief, I want to just also uh, recognize my colleague here, Councilman Rodriguez, who has been working on these issues before I got to the city council and throughout his life, truthfully, but has been doing a lot in the council to address some of the issues that have been raised and have been brought to us uh, and when you come when you talk about this industry. But um, you know, what the one observation I've had over all these years is that we have built a system of ground transportation in the city really sort of by piecemeal. We've, it's been additive over the years. You take a radio out of a taxi cab and you have the emergence of the livery industry in New York City. You have uh, a desire or want to have expanded options to the outer boroughs or you have a changing technology. You have global cities emerging that want to have similar transportation options and you have the emergence of things like Uber and Lyft. And we've, um, as we've done that, we've, you know, every, every new solution creates a new problem, but this has all, I think, come to a head in the last few years, particularly as we have new entrants coming into the market. And the, uh, as I entered into the city council, there was, I think, two big transportation issues facing the city and the state. One was what to do with the MTA and how to fix and repair and rebuild trust into the MTA, and the second was how to what to do around the for hire and taxi industry as we were having, um, we were hearing about pain points coming from those who were driving the taxis and those who have medallions, but also issues that face my district around congestion or a lot of districts about congesting and traffic and adding vehicles to the streets of New York City. 
And so, um, you know, when, when, I, when I got there, this issue became sort of right at the front of our conversations in the city council. And for who, who lives around here? Who lives nearby? Okay. A few, a few neighbors and people I recognize and uh, constituents. Um, but for many of us who live around here, but also if you live in other areas, particularly areas that are growing uh, and r rapidly, you are seeing more and more T-plate vehicles. So that mean, essentially means a tax, either a taxi or an Uber or a Lyft or a Juno or a Via or whatever other, or a Carmel or a Dial 7. Uh, you name the company, you're seeing uh, more of those. There's just simply more of them that are available today but the, than there were a couple of years ago. But the issues that we started to have was to understand um, how to balance both the, a few different issues. One is the demand and the increasing demand and the increasing usage of those, especially as the MTA was uh, failing many New Yorkers, people were relying on other ways to get around. Um, uh, the increase of that and the increased demand of it, and particularly in my district, a very high demand for uh, uh, ground transportation uh, versus how do we balance that versus adding vehicles and congestion to our midtown corridor and making our streets busier uh, than they ever were and slower, and essentially slower than they ever were. Second is how do we address issues around workers in an environment, uh, both from the taxi workers but, and, and also new workers who are uh, taking advantage, if you want to call it, of the gig economy. And um, drivers, some drivers in New York City have been doing this for a very long time, but now we're doing it for new, new ways. And how to address making sure they're making the right amount of money, they can make a living, we're treating them appropriately. Um, and also how to be a global city, but also attend to local issues. I will account for you guys talk about some of the solutions that we did at the council to address some of these. But I think the ever-pressing issue for those who live in my district or live in Midtown or live, go through Midtown or in this area or in, throughout New York City is how do we find that right balance between have, offering people options, have, being able to get them around and get them around quickly, but also to not forget about the person who is working and making relying on this as their job and their primary source of income, and also how to not lead to an oversupply uh, that uh, essentially would end up meeting. We have idling and we have environmental issues and so forth and so on. Um, I think last year some of the bills that we did got to some of these issues. We have a lot more to go when we talk about taxi medallions and the drivers and uh, making sure that we are, uh, to, as a city, being conscious of, of, of that part of the equation as well. Um, but I, I will just tell you, I recall having this. There was a former taxi commission. I remember being on an elevator with him one day. And I said, you know, I hear Uber is really killing all the small guys, the local guys. And, he, and uh, at, at the time, I remember his response to me was, well, isn't it great if you go to come home from London or you go to Paris or Tokyo that you have one app on your phone and that gets you everywhere you need to go no matter what city you are. And I thought, yeah, that, that actually is pretty nice if you go to those places. But it also does miss a major point of the equation, which is what to do about folks who've been in this industry for a very long time, have built businesses, whether it's the, the taxi industry or those long-time businesses that have been operating in the outer boroughs, north of Manhattan, Councilman Rodriguez District. So that is a big issue that faces us. Uh, I want to be I'm grateful that you are bring us in to talk about it today. I'm going to stick around for a little bit. But I'm actually going to a thing around tourism, which is, is obviously part of that conversation as well. Um, but I will hand it over to Councilor Rodriguez before we, we move on to questions. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm sorry for being late, but uh, no, my, my colleague and <laughs> I, I use it my sick train. I did use a yellow taxi from, from where I was from 116 and First Avenue in Lexington to go to the crash, where unfortunately the three years old was killed today, crossing the intersection with her mother. Uh, and, 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 and then from there on, getting to the sixth train, but we got a little bit wet, you know, trying to just use the mass transportation. Uh, I feel that I remember being at City College when I was there in the 90s, and I tried to persuade the, the chairman of the history department, I think Professor Watt, he used to be the chairman there, and I say, look, we're going to a march. At that time, we were organizing a, against the issue increase in budget and we took City College and queued in 89 and 91. And, I, and the professor told me, listen, I did a lot of march in the 60s. I was there in the civil rights movement. I was there in the anti-nuclear weapons. You guys do your job now. I feel that we, we, we are lucky, so lucky. Uh, the oldest one had this great opportunity to share with the new generation about the present, the past, the present, and the future in transportation. 
Like, I joined the Occupy movement, you know, when we were there at Socotty Park, and for me, the beauty of that movement in that see so many people sleeping over who were the senior citizens that were part of the movement in the 60s. In the 90s, in the new generation, the new millennium, the new one who is more ready to agitate. You know, when I marched two days ago on the climate justice, you know, it was the children, it was the youth. You know, they saying, we want to learn in the street. We want to learn the environmental issue. So transportation is a justice, it's a social justice issue. That's the first thing that we need to do. Because in my case, I live my life every day, as today is my last day. Because you never know when the last day. So I, I will never be the politician that tries to be politically correct or say what people would like to hear. So what is going on in the city of New York is that when it came to the taxi industry, the owners of those medallions, the bank, the insurance, they forgot on who are the clients. And it's not the riders, are the drivers. And I think that they have created this connection. And the drivers being struggling so hard to make the living. I used to be a liberal taxi driver. Uh, I didn't have the honor to be a yellow taxi driver, but I used to be a liberal one in my third job. After washing dishes at Old Henry Restaurant, West 4 and 6th Avenue, now it's a capital bank. And then doing sandwich at Food Concept Corporation at an attitude World Trade Center. So I be promoted, being a liberal taxi driver, putting myself through City College. So what I have seen is that through all those decades, and I made the connection about the previous generation, the senior citizens, those of you that make contribution through the private, the academic, you know, the social movement. Here we are in the most beautiful time in history where there's a whole new millennium generation and my daughter, 13 years old, in that generation, that get to get information on time, that they are not denied what probably we were denying 30 years ago. A lot of deal they were cut in the back room. And a lot of financial business were structured without a lot of consumers, consumer being part of that conversation. So today's conversation is about an industry that have failed, an industry that when we look, and for me, I don't have one medallion owner that I know from the district that I represent. I don't have a yellow taxi driver who live in Northern Manhattan above 165 Street that I know. I, I live in your district. You see? Okay. And you know me very well. Okay, but I didn't know that you live in my district. So, but what I say is, even though not living in my district, no one has been taking this fight harder than myself. And you know, in a way that I've been taking a lot of heat, in a way that we've been passing all those laws, creating the universal license, creating more flexibility on the transition take place between a new medallion owners and the bank. The one addressing the importance to, you know, give more support to the yellow taxi industry. And I've been doing because I believe in social justice, and that's my rationale. So at this moment, I feel that we have a big responsibility to the industry that we have failed. We promoted in 2014 that if anyone would buy a medallion, then we have exclusive right to pick up, drop up throughout the five world, and that they were the only one that had a unique privilege. They pay a lot of money. They pay a million dollars. They pay $700,000. And from the 15,000 medallion owners, we have 6,000 who are individual ones. Those individuals live, as I say, I don't have a constituency that is major from the South Asian community, the Bangladesh, in the latter one, in Queens, and exciting. I don't have one there. My community. However, I've been taking this fight as I try to be helpful to anyone. Why? Because again, we, the city of New York, created an industry that we say you are the one that had the, the right to pick up and drop up. And listening from the yellow, when you hear from them directly, they say one thing. Please enforce zero tolerance to anyone that is not yellow that do pick up or drop up above 96th Street, JFK and LaGuardia. Enforce on those 
hotel in the luxury building that they have some coordination between whoever worked there and the Uber and the Lyft driver to create the condition to bring those, not because the writer did the pre-arrangement through apps. We cannot go backward. Technology innovation is part of our future, and especially more to the youngest generation. However, I feel that the industry of the yellow taxi will be able to do much better. Besides that, I do support bailout. I support that we did it to, 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 to re-estate. I'm not talking about the $6 billion. Because the way of how anyone who is against it say, well, how we would put in $6 billion. I'm not saying that. And that's not what the group association are promoting for. They say, in a scale plan, we should be able to put together $1 billion and be responsible to the medallion owners, the drivers, and the individuals one, the 6,000, for them to be able to continue providing their services. Why? Because tourism is part of the city. We got 65 million tourists that came here last year. We are 8.6 million New Yorkers. If we are able, and I'm saying that because I have a responsibility to balance my role, I, I will be promoting for the Libre and the corporate black car to be supported to. Because the crisis today, and we created a yellow taxi medallion task force, the whole focus has been only on the yellow drivers. Well, I also, they also had to deal with hundreds of library bases that they've been closing. And listening in conversation to the yellow and the, and the advocate, they know that the market is not the South Bronx. They know that the market is not Washington Heights. Their market is down 96th Street. These are two reasons that they go to the hotels, are those who live in the luxury building. So what I'm trying to do again, working together with my colleague and Council Member Levin, is to be able to complete our work in the yellow tax, in the, in the medallion tax force that we are the co-chair, together with representation from the all sector of the industry, the banks, the academic, uh, the drivers, the medallion owners, and we expected as we will finish our task force re uh, discussion in January, that two months after we were able to put together a plan. So that's what I'm trying to do. But I just want to highlight that the crisis today affect the yellow taxi, medallions and drivers, but they also have a negative impact in the corporate black car that they also been losing drivers, that they are not able to be able to recruit more drivers to work with them. That also affect the delivery drivers, and for me as a chairman of the Transportation Committee, working together with my colleague with whom I've been working before being elected, and now as a role as a council member, we would like to do a part, we will do a part to save this industry from this crisis, that is the worst one that they have dealt with in the whole history. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, so I'm just mindful of the time. <laughs> it's past 5.30, but uh, if you have just uh, um, some brief remarks that you wanna share in, in closing for your portion, that would be fantastic. I'm sorry, I'm sorry I have to leave everybody. Um, but I, I, I did say you know earlier, I'm, I'm leaving actually going to an event, I uh, relate to tourism and the getting some of these issues right matter for New Yorkers because we all live here and we need to get around and we need to figure out how to have an efficient commute. For some of, some people rely on the for hire and taxi industry as a primary way to get around. Many people use it to, to uh, on the weekends or to fill in the gaps. But we also have to be mindful of the experience. I mean, that's a sort of you know, a counter narrative to what I was saying earlier, though, is that we also have to be mindful of the 65 million that come here and those who uh, spend a weekend here or, uh, you, you know, and, and don't know how to navigate the subway system or uh, on a rainy day or just because they want to uh, use, uh, uh, you know, the, for the ground transportation industry. And so um, I think that the, the challenge here is always how to balance those needs of us as New Yorkers, alongside being a global city that does want to accommodate people when they come to visit here, and how to make sure, and then, and, and then second to that is making sure that we are raising standards. Just, just one thing I'd say is, last year we did pass a package of legislation that uh, Councilor Rodriguez played a large role in that was to address some issues in the industry, and I'll just tell you what they were. One of them got, I got a lot of emails about, so, but I'll tell you anyway. Um, one was about uh, regulating the amount of licenses that we issued in New York City, essentially putting on a cap, a temporary cap, moratorium on issuing licenses um, to uh, stop and halt and be able to actually get to some of the root causes of 
uh, of the growth and, and the consequences of the growth in the industry. Uh, number two was we actually uh, didn't create a minimum for wages in terms of our pay, in terms of our drivers, which I think is now around $17 and it's, there's a 17, okay. Yeah, and, uh, and that was $15 plus of the minimum wage plus added costs and expenses to that as well to create a new standard of pay, which actually does actually create some, has a relationship, I think, to supply as well, because in the prior world of a for hire vehicle driver, there could be an incentive just to put as many cars as you want on the road. Now they're actually meeting a minimum meant you had to actually kind of achieve supply and demand in a different way. And the third was we created a new category of high volume companies that uh, are for hire vehicle companies. And we've been doing things like looking at the medallion crisis and ways the city can intercede in that. All, all, none of that I think is gonna completely solve the problem, but it did give us some room to be able to do things differently and to look at parts of the industry differently. So um, uh, I have to leave and I, so I apologize for my departure, but I did wanna mention that because that was a big part of what we did last year, and I think that work is only a beginning piece to what we have to go. And in some of those cases, we were really the first big city, or probably the first city anywhere, um, to uh, to really to look at like like wages in terms of a uh, companies in the gig economy, particularly around ground transportation. So, anyway, thank you. I hope you enjoy this. The rest of the event. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I can answer a couple questions. I will be taking questions if they are available. Hey, yes. While we are talking about the ask car, we just think everybody's focused on Uber. That's the big one. Mm -hmm. But nobody forgets about the illegal ask. People drive the car, they look, and they got thousands of them covered. And they got people who from the island, Westchester County, work for Uber. That kind of trade, mm -hmm. no one will mm -hmm. spot them. And they're still working on the Uber as a leader. And nobody pays attention to that. Because this is how the problem is. So just to define that, I just been also make sure I'm getting this correctly. You could drive in different jurisdictions or for a, a company, whether it could be a it could be a local neighborhood or county business in Westchester or Long Island. You could also drive for a, a app company in another jurisdiction, but not be licensed in New York City. Or you could alternately just take your vehicle out one day and go to an airport and try to pick somebody up. And and what are we doing around that? Is that the so essentially, we're not we're missing that part of the conversation. I think is your point. Is that fair to say? Well, the point is the law for the taxi and limousine. When you are driving on here as a yellow cab, if I have to say I'm going to any other borough or any other town in New York, such as Nassau County, Westchester County, or Newark, and Park, I cannot pick up the repair. Period. Oh, oh. If Uber has somebody coming in either way, Long Island, they drop off. The app is supposed to be turned off okay. until they go. This is the same rules for the green car when you enter below 96, the radio turn off. Right. So that's the same thing. The Uber, uh, we have so many different that I know. They got the uh, app running by the Chinese, they got their own app, they go in front of the hotel, they stop job, they got everything, and then find the train. In the five below, anybody who does or transportation for that in the <coughs> city has to have a license registered by the taxi and limousine. Those guys don't have that. So I, I hear you. So I have a piece of legislation in the city council that actually I picked up from my predecessor, which enforces against uh, straight plate, what we call straight plates, which is uh, those who are just picking up using a personal vehicle, I actually would have liked to see us pass. It increases penalties for people where you might be getting in a person's personal vehicle. They haven't been licensed by the city of New York, and you are putting yourself potentially in a dangerous situation. They might have been even for kicked off, kicked their license. They might have lost their license even in some instances. In the ways, in the in the in the places where somebody is coming from outside of the city, is not licensed by a taxi limousine commission, but still performing a pickup that would not be legal for them to do, there isn't, there are ways to enforce against it using trip data, trip record data, but it's a, it, incredible, I would, I would ma imagine incredibly difficult for the TLC to be able to enforce against that. I have, I can try to think about it after the panel about how to, how to increase enforcement around those who are not licensed to be able to do pickups here. 
but I'd have to think about that issue more in terms of what the right enforcement mechanism. Obviously, if you get caught doing that at an airport, you would there, but difficult to do. There would be penalties involved or potentially points on your license. But um, uh, that is a problem. I just have not, to be honest, given a lot of thought to it. I have a bill about straight plate enforcement where you're getting into somebody's personal vehicle. I think that's incredibly dangerous and, and risky for New Yorkers. But something I'm happy to take a look at. I, I'm gonna also for some I hand it off to these guys because okay. I'm respectful of their time as well. But I just, my understanding, I'm gonna focus on the congestion pricing issue. Right? Mm -hmm. it's, my understanding is currently of the state legislature, is mm -hmm. that correct? Mm -hmm. But what my understanding is it just passed it was this last legislative session. And uh, the question of the offsets for those who live in the community, and I think your community is affected, mm -hmm. I've yet to be addressed. You know the businesses. I know in Chinatown it's gonna be affected, it's gonna affect negatively. And these businesses run on very low margins. They provide cheap food resources. And that can be fundamentally undermined with this congestion pricing issue. But getting back to the other the question of congestion pricing, the efficacy of that for cold to begin with. Now, we, we've been dealing with the question of the Verrazano Bridge issue, where there's one-way tolls, one-way tolls, and that's creating congestion. Why, was that, why wasn't that question addressed, number one? And the question of the NTA. NTA, there's no accountability on how this money is being spent. $4.5 billion for the second avenue subway. And that's a, a great waste for just for three stations. Now you're asking people to pay for congestion pricing for, for, for what? Where there's no money, there's no accountability of the fund. All right. I got you. I hear your question. I understand. Okay, let me take a step back. It is, I will say, it is state purview, but I'm a supporter of congestion pricing, so I'm happy to talk about it. Um, What's the Verizon Bridge issue? That the I think Charles. Okay, I think Charles can yeah, probably yeah. handle this because he's um, the, Ver the Verrazano Bridge is a federally controlled issue because. That's good. That's okay, so we, you the know. Democratic Party. Okay, okay. Ex excuse me. Excuse me. Why don't we focus on what we're here for, which is to talk about the past, present, and future of the entire for hire vehicle <laughs> sector? Okay, I I could we could talk you and I for hours about the Verrazano Bridge and congestion pricing, but I don't think that's. So there'll be that, a reception after this from 6.30 to 7.30. Uh, I just want to be mindful of, yeah. <laughs> so Not to leave at the vegetable yeah. bed, but, uh, So let's here, just, right? let's thank let him go and uh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, so there'll be plenty of time for Q&A at 6.15 to 6.30 and then yeah. after at the reception. So I'm now going to sit closer <laughs> to my wonderfully esteemed panelists. And uh, I just want to kind of sit on the table in the deference of time. I didn't have, really have a chance to do that. So I'll, I'll set the table again, if that's all right with you all. OK. So on the table today are some key policy issues affecting the New York City taxi industry. You've already heard one of them, which is to use uh, Councilman Rodriguez's term, the bailout, right, of owner medallions. Is that right? And so. But also congestion pricing, which has just been raised, um, and a proposed cap in vehicles for higher vehicles, which Councilman Powers raised before he had to depart. So those are some of the things that are, that are being talked about and that's kind of on the table for our conversation tonight. And then I also wanted to highlight the lived experiences, of course, of immigrant drivers because most of the drivers are disproportionately immigrants. They're South Asian Americans. Um, and in the past, my understanding is that driving a taxi was really a step up into kind of, uh, you know, into a working class, middle class status, a step up for the drivers and their families and for the educational aspirations of the driver's children. And so I kind of want to bring that to the table to see where we are with that. But um, Councilman Rodriguez, did you want to say a few more things? Or perhaps I can, I can yes, that would be great. Mind. That would be fantastic. So, uh, Mr. Javi Tariq, if you can per perhaps speak to some of the policy solutions that I know that your organization has really pushed forward in terms of the bailout, yeah? yeah. Hi, good evening, everybody. My name is Javi Tariq, and uh, we are the part of uh, New York Taxi Workers Alliance, who is a 23 years old organization, and uh, now we have uh, 21,000 members, and we are fighting for yellow cab drivers, green cab drivers, and FHV drivers, livery drivers, we bring uh, them all on one platform because we all are having a problem. 
the first thing as a uh, mr yudanis uh, rodrig has uh, explained it uh, i and uh, textbook lines is thankful to council member and uh, mayor also that uh, finally they pay attention to this issue and last year they start uh, working on it to, to put a cap on uh, uber cars while we wanted to put a cap uh, on uh, in 2014 when those caps were only 14 15000 but we don't know why our uh, beloved governor como gave a free hand to uber to not put a cap on that and they keep increasing the cars and there are uh, they reached to 90000 cars where these all problems started because uber we, we are not against any new technology yeah before that uh, fhv car was uh, and um dispatched by the radio and now the radio system is gone that uh, app came in a um, phone but the whole profit is going to the company not to the drivers they give so many good advertisement come work with us you're going to make $5000 you're going to make $4000 no this is all lie being a driver by myself i drove 23 years yellow cab day and night and uh, we know sorry so for that i don't know i don't know where it's uh, getting the yeah maybe uh <laughs> <laughs> we know yeah i think you should take some time and then we'll go to the next yeah to um mr criminal mm mm-hmm. just saying yeah. um I have so much to say I I don't know where to begin but maybe I will uh by thanking council member Rodriguez for going to First Avenue and 116th Street um to um observe and commemorate and um give voice um after the tragedy today this is the the sixth uh child under age 10 run over and killed by a driver in the city of New York this year. Um council member Rodriguez has been um a real leader in street <coughs> safety. Um and it is in marked contrast I have to say this to our mayor who offers thoughts and prayers, thoughts and prayers and if it's not good enough uh if thoughts and prayers aren't good enough after mass shootings they are not good enough uh after children and others are taken from us um on the streets of the city it, it, through a, an a transportation system um that our mayor seems to be uh passive about but i'm sorry that's sort of editorializing but i do want to thank you very much you know well i'll leave that um i'm i'm a, I'm a sort of a newcomer uh to the taxi sector for beginning in 2007 i created a spreadsheet model under the sponsorship of theodore keel um the uh patron of tonight's event and uh a supporter or his family of roosevelt house but it wasn't until the fall of 2017 a little more than 2 years ago when the governor's staff reached out to me and said we we've seen your model we think it's pretty good we'd like to work with it um that i even brought ubers and lifts into the model my entire four hire vehicle sector was just the yellow cabs um and i i regret my um being late to this issue i regret um the city of new york and the state of new york's being late to this issue because um you know with all due respect to the amazing reportage of new york times investigative reporter brian rosenthal 
who a year ago, and then more recently, a couple of weeks ago, um, has had articles about predatory lending and how it has ravaged uh, the taxi industry in New York City. That is a distant second, the predatory lending, a distant sec second to Uber. I'm going to use Uber as shorthand for Uber, Lyft, Via, and Juno, to their impact on the yellow cab sector. Since 2015, the number of four hire vehicles, and when I say four hire vehicles, I mean all of them, okay, um, that touch the taxi zone, which is Manhattan south of 96th Street, I'll simplify a little bit, you know, whether they start there or end there, the number of such trips um, have gone up by 17% total. But during this period, the number of trips carried by yellow cabs has gone down by half by 50%, and as we know, about 90% of all yellow cab trips touch the taxi zone. And I don't understand how it is that a franchise that was given to yellow cab owners and drivers going back to, to the 1930s, thank you, was sold. I'll take that. Um, an exclusive franchise, not in the entire city, but within the taxi zone, for the exclusive right to pick up street hails, how somehow that got uh, contracted or interpreted uh, that if vehicles were summoned with an app on a phone, that that was uh, okay, that that was not uh, raiding the territory that had been entrusted and... Um, sold to, or I'm sorry, I'm looking for the right word, that had been you know, given in exchange for payment. Um, and I don't know if that can be undone, but I do have a, a couple of ideas to start the conversation. Um, but it must be said, and this is something that my friends in uh, the New York uh, uh, Taxi Workers Alliance you know, that I've tried to convey to them, to other medallion owners and drivers whom I know, some of whom are here tonight. Um, there is a problem, it is not a problem of geometry, but it is a problem of space. It is a spatial problem. And one of the things that I have extracted from my model of New York City traffic is the following. This is the one wonky thing, I hope, that I'm going to say this evening which is that except in the middle of the night or the very early morning when there are so few vehicles on the street, and I'm here I'm talking about Manhattan, and I'm actually talking about uh, most of the Manhattan taxi zone, but I'm talking about the Manhattan Central Business District south of 60th Street, which is also going to be the congestion pricing zone, that any vehicle, any automobile that is driven for a minute on the streets, this is an average, you know, it's, it's worse in the heart of Midtown, but it, it's less at the fringes, is slowing down all of the other vehicles in its kind of force field or traffic field by a total of a little bit more than two minutes. Sorry, a little bit less than two minutes, not that it matters. This is a rough approximation. And I don't mean that, you know, that one vehicle is slowing down another vehicle in particular by that, but the aggregate of all of the slowdowns that emanate from this one hypothetical vehicle being driven for a minute. And if you calculate the value of drivers and vehicles' time, and if you do a weighted average of the private cars, no matter what I might think about them, private cars, the trucks, the 18-wheelers, the people and the drivers in Ubers and in Yellows, you know, et cetera, and of course, buses. That lost uh, almost two minutes is worth a little bit more than $2. In other words, there's only so much space to go around. And there is a potentially infinite demand for that space. And so we can't have a kind of... Um, not one size fits all. There's another expression of you know uh, uh, that. Uh, no, I, I'm sorry. It's it's a term that used to be used for, for like energy policy. Like you know, let's do it all. Uh, 
Yeah, all of the above. Thank you, Billy Freeland. Um, th that all of the above doesn't work because what all of the above, and that's pretty much what we've had, what it means is that buses don't move. It means that ambulances don't move. It means that even you know, Ubers and Yellows don't move. And one of the possible benefits of congestion pricing is going to be, but although it's not enough, that there's going to be some space cleared out in the heart of Manhattan, which is going to make travel by yellows and Ubers, paradoxically, somewhat more efficient. And so the demand for their services will go up somewhat. And yes, all these sort of feedback loops, they're built into the model that I've created, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, but it means that this all of the above doesn't work. And there's going to have to be some sort of retrenchment. Now, if I had my way, if I were running the show, and I don't even know if what I'm going to say is permissible by, by law, um, I would be doing the following. This is sort of my big proposal. Um, that any for hire vehicle, when it's operating in the Manhattan taxi zone, that's south of 96th Street. And by the way, this shouldn't start until congestion pricing starts. I don't want to burden for hire, for hire vehicle drivers of any stripe more than they already are. But once congestion pricing starts, that they, that, uh, and they've got a passenger in the vehicle, that instead of being charged the $2.75 or the $2.50 lump sum, one size fits all surcharge, that they would be charged by the minute. And this would then, this is sort of a rational policy. This is congestion pricing in a kind of pure form. And this could all be measured and mediated by mandating con uh, connectivity for the Ubers and Lyfts, et cetera, that has been required for yellow cabs under the TPEP program for about, about a dozen years. So this would be pretty much tamper-proof and game-proof, which is very important when you're dealing with corporations like Uber and Lyft, et cetera. Um, now, it would be possible, perhaps, I don't know, I'm sorry that I, I'm sort of spewing this without necessarily knowing, that the Ubers could be charged more per minute than the yellows as a way of balancing the equities that have been thrown completely out of whack by permitting the Uber at all to invade the yellow cab franchise, again, just within the Manhattan taxi zone. But the other thing, the, the, the leading edge of this proposal, which I do believe is well, within the purview of the city, not the state, but the city, would be to charge the Ubers and Lyft, et cetera. I don't know wh whether, maybe you can help me, do we call it a hovering charge or a trawling charge or an idle charge or a stockpiling charge for every minute that their vehicles are within the Manhattan taxi zone and are idle, that they don't have passengers. And this would be a way, this is not going to solve the problem. Um, but this would be, I believe, more efficient, more equitable, and more foolproof than the well-intentioned, but I believe, Councilman Rodriguez, not as workable as we want it to be, cap on idle time for the Ubers that the city council uh, enacted a year ago and that the Taxi and Limousine Commission implemented on August 7th with its, its new rules, which is going to go into effect uh, one part in February and another part next August. I commend the city council for um, the wage standard for the Uber drivers, for the cap on the number of you know, Ubers at all, and for this cap on the for hire vehicle idling time. But it's, I fear that it is too gameable, too manipulable, um, and not nearly as effective and fair as some sort of per minute pricing, especially if the per minute pricing could be used to redress the balance uh, and give something back uh, to uh, the yellow cab drivers and medallion owners. Sorry, I was uh, right in the middle of talking, and we were just talking about uh, the situation of drivers. Doesn't matter, they are a yellow cab driver, they are a 
green cab driver, they are FHV driver, they are Uber drivers. All of drivers are suffering. The profit goes to all the way to the Uber company, not drivers. They, as I told you, they gave so much advertisement. Driver came to buy the Uber cars. The $40,000 car, they are going to end up paying for $80,000, $90,000. But the main clue is whenever Uber want, they can block them. So those drivers are out of job. Now they are suffering how they're going to pay the insurance, how they're going to pay the mortgages, how they're going to do that. So those drivers are also stuck now. But other hand, because the, these cars reach up to 90,000, 80,000, the prices goes down for the individual medallion owner. At this time, over 6,000 families, not only drivers, their families are suffering. People are doing suicides because they cannot keep up to paying up these predatory loans, which are 6,000, 600,000, 800,000, and so much. It is a big scam going on between lenders and the brokers and uh, banks, which we are already working with the New York Times. After one year of our work, New York Times published a big article about this issue. And we are working on that. One and a half month ago, Taxi Work Alliance went all the way to Congress. And we have a hearing in front of a finance committee about this issue. Two days ago, the, the, the president of uh, uh, banks and CEO of uh, uh, credit unions, they were in front of a uh, uh, hearing committee to talking about that. As we are trying to, um, um, we are thankful that mayor started a task force about this issue and we are working on that. As we are seeing is that if two days price is $150,000, the city should buy those all loans from the banks for $150,000 and give back to the drivers for 20 years on 3%. Because in 2014 city auctions, the medallions and they make $874 million. For these 600,000 600, medall uh, 6, individual medallion owners, if they buy that loan for 150, it's going to be $900 million. And they give back to the drivers for 20 years on 3%, city can still make $274 million in profit. So that is our main goal, and that the only way that we can save those 6,000 6, individual medallion owners of families who are really suffering a lot. We are sitting inside a car, and we know what kind of problem we are facing. 12 hours, 14 hours a day you drive. Other hand, there are 14 different agencies are there, out there, to giving us summons. And especially TLC summons are, their fines are so high. You earn $100 for a day after working for 18, 16 hours, your one fine can be go to thousands of dollars to pay to TLC. So what, only drivers are suffering. None other person, none other agency is suffering. They are making profit on drivers. And the other hand, the Uber company is making profit on drivers. So that is the only solution for, uh, to save individual medallion owners that city should talk about this, take a uh, uh, hand on those all loans and forgive the other loans which people are suffering to paying their $600,000, $800,000 uh, loans. That, that is are really a big scam through those uh, predatory lending and that we wanted to see that uh, how they, we can solve this uh, problem. We are thankful that uh, nowadays the uh, council members and others uh, council members are looking on these all issues. On the other hand, at this time while Uber is saying that we need more cars, more cars, no, 40% Uber cars are still idling, they are empty. The drivers go back home, 
with less money, even though they make less than minimum wage. So, but Uber is not giving any kind of uh, their record to the government, to the city government, or to the TLC. Look, it took us uh, 14 years to pass Taxi Driver Protection Act. We went to the Albany for 14 years. Finally, that Protection Act was passed, but uh, Governor Peterson denied, uh, vetoed it last minute. Thanks to Mayor de Blasio, he passed in 2014, where we can have a little bit of safety for ourselves. But Uber drivers, Lyft drivers in New York City who are, has a FHV license and FHV cars, they have also so many assault happened, but Uber and Lyft are denying to cooperate with the police to giving the information of those uh, uh, people who, who assault the drivers. So that we have to solve those kind of matters. It's, we should not give a, a whole economic power to only one corporate company. Nowadays, Uber is still charging such price to the passenger. Our biggest campaign is for Uber drivers that if whatever they charge upfront price from the passenger, they can keep 15% uh, commission and 85% go to the driver. They are still telling to the passenger, okay, you wanna go to JFK, $200. But to driver, they're gonna pay only $30, $40 because they are going to pay, pay by distance. So these kind of so many exploitation going on, they have so many uh, way to uh, suck the blood of our drivers, how they can do it. So that we have to pay attention. Also, we are paying MTA tax, 250 congestion price they put on us, but we never have rights to go in bus lane. You go to Europe, you are part of transportation. You can keep the passenger, you can drive in bus lanes, but even though we are paying, we are bailing out MTA, Taxi drivers are not allowed to pick up a passenger or drop off a passenger in bus lane. By the TLC rule, we are allowed to pick up and drop off. But when we pick up a drop off, right way we got someone. It's a hundred fifteen dollar someone. Where should driver has to drop the passengers? So I see. Um, <laughs> sorry, <Mr. laughs> I see Mr. Uh, Kamala like shaking his head. Maybe if he could just interject a moment, and then I'd like to bring it round. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I, I mean, I don't want to jump on that point, but uh, you know, I think probably everybody in this room is aware of um, the fabulous success in the past few months of 14th Street, where uh, the city has uh, finally uh, taken a major artery um, and essentially, I'm going to oversimplify again, uh, banned. Um, private vehicles, which includes for hire vehicles, because they are still essentially just carrying one or two people. And MTA buses are carrying 10, 20, 40, 50 people. And with private vehicles banned and trucks very closely regulated, uh, bus speeds uh, across 14th Street have improved by 30 or 40 percent. Ridership is already up 25 or 30 percent. And this needs to be duplicated around the city. And it doesn't work if one vehicle, whether it's uh, Mayor de Blasio's proverbial uh, you know, mom or dad who's just trying to like drop off and, or pick up the kid, um, or if it's somebody in a, an Uber or a yellow cab. And the, again, the spatial constraints in our city are so strong uh, and exigent that we have to be prioritizing the vehicles that are the most efficient. And I am sorry to say that that is not private cars, it is not yellow cabs, and it is not Uber. So on this point, Jave, I have to disagree. That's fine, I agree with you, but then, 
people should talk to old court. You know, if we pick up a passenger and passenger said, no, I want to drop on this corner. If we don't drop off them, what they do, they pick up a phone, call to TLC, file a complaint without any hearing. TLC wrote a letter, put four violations on you. This much is $300, $400, $500, and with points. And passengers don't have to come to the court. We are seeing every day, hundreds of drivers are coming with this kind of summon that uh, without any knowledge, the, uh, oh, any nine million New Yorker can pick up phone and call to Oath, Oath Court and say, oh, he didn't drop me where I wanted. He dropped me far corner instead of near corner. What, where the heck we should go? Then you should stop to the Oath Court. They should not send us this kind of summon. So I thank you. I would just like to have Councilman Rodriguez weigh in because we've heard a lot so far um, in terms of the, you know, the bailout, uh, but also in terms of, you know, limiting the number of vehicles and also th the extent to which they're on the streets and can be idling. I mean, there's just a lot here. Um, so I wanted to know, you know, in your role as the chair of the Transportation Committee for the City Council of New York, I mean, what are kind of the priorities? I mean, we can't all do it, we can't do everything all at once, or can we? In New York City? <laughs> no. <laughs> in, a, in a city where, you know, yes, being a council member, we know we always have to have a strong scheme because everyone has a solution and all we all have a strong opinion. So yes, imagine when you move on and you have all the role, like you need to be ready. And of course, politics is not in government, politics is also in the academic institution. So you guys also live that experience every day. So I look, I, I think that we need to be hopeful in this situation. If there's nothing, life is not black and, li black and white. You know, there's always gonna be opportunity that we have. It, I feel that it, my approach is that if we enforce more and better down 96th Street, JFK and LaGuardia, yellow taxi drivers, they will be able, they will do good. They will do much better. And enforcement means if you go to Pier 83, at the any time that you go for education or recreation or event in those boats, and you come out from there, there's gonna be like a 20 Uber drivers trying to get riders. Not because the rider did a pre-arrangement from the inside the boat, but it's there. If you go to, in front of any hotel, you will see Uber drivers, you know, coming in trying to get some tourists. And you pass by through a luxury building. There's also some type of pre-coordination between people who you work knowing all, but in some places, and some of the Uber drivers. And I landed, Hen and my staff here, Hen and I, we came back from DR like three weeks ago, and coming out from the JFK, like, you see like those drivers, uh, not the, the yellow one, the yellow is dealing with the reality of being isolated now. You know, the way of how the Uber and live, whatever, <laughs> They use the influence for whoever they know at the state level and, and at the city level. And instead of being able, someone that landed from JFK and LaGuardia to be able to pick the yellow yes there, when you landed, now you had to walk a mile through there to get a yellow taxi. So I feel, and then when we were coming out, there was someone said, do you need a taxi? And someone told me like, if that happened inside the JFK, like then the safety of New York City is in trouble when there's no one who is behind the screen and not be able to see that there's like illegal action happening there when someone is stopping a passenger asking if you need a taxi, not a yellow, but someone that probably many of them, they don't have a license by TLC. Or they could be the Uber, they can be the Lyft. They can be whoever are providing any services and not the yellow. So I feel that, again, if we, and I say that because I will be doing, you will hear me doing two things. One, I advocating for the corporate black car and from the liberal taxi driver. 
And as I say, having conversation, and for me, their space, in this case of delivery basis, is above 96th Street. Like still today, the dynamic, you know, the markets in supply and demand yeah. that the drivers, the yellow has is that if you drop someone in Riverdale or in Inwood, if you are a driver or if I would be a driver, I just want to come back as soon as possible sure. down 96th Street. You're wrong about that. Okay, brother. I lived that experience like a like few years ago. I'm not here, a few days ago. I've been going to Tremont Avenue. And there was a yellow taxi, and I understand it as I, if I will be the driver who was coming out through Diamond and Broadway. And I said, I'm going to Tremont and Park Avenue. and say, I'm sorry, but I'm going downtown. Because if you pick up someone at Inward and you take that person to a Jerome Avenue on Tremont and Webster, when you drop the passenger, most likely there's not a demand. So you will be going, I will be going if I will be a yellow taxi driver to where I had the demand. And the demand today is mainly at the JFK, a La Guardia, in front of those hotels. The city of New York still has not built ourselves as a five borough city where tourists, they've been going to the South Bronx, that they go into Washington Heights, that they go to the underserved community. You're wrong. That, brother, come on. Come on. I don't want to interrupt you. But, but listen, let me finish. Let me finish. Okay, you because, you know, in that conversation with someone leading on behalf, advocating on the drivers, I can say, and you know, I've been in the front line, taking all those eat, all those negative mailing from Uber and for, and for living, whatever, when we're trying to, you know, to put a cap in 2014. You've been very helpful to the taxi Okay. The so, taxi but you're saying stuff right now that has me a little disturbed. You keep talking about 96th Street. I don't know why you keep talking about 96th Street. When I bought a medallion, I bought a medallion to work the city of New York, the five boroughs, the airport at, Lavo at Newark. I, I, you keep trying to, you, you had a little uh, press conference the other day in front of City Hall with your livery buddies, and you try to put 96th Street at the forefront. And I see you, you know, constantly, like I said, you've done a lot of good, and you try to help us out a lot, but, Lately, you have this 96th Street on your mind. I do have, so, so, okay, let, let me, sorry. So I do have it, and I say publicly, as I say privately, and I say it's in the yellow taxi medallion, in the medallion task force, that conversation been going on. I'm advocating, I'm advocating to double the numbers. Right now, we have like 100 men and women that dedicated to TLC to do enforcement. And for me, it doesn't make sense when 25% of those enforcement, they are sent to Webster Avenue and Tremont. What are they doing there when the issue that we have from the yellow is about lack of enforcement in Midtown area? So I've been, something that is not popular at the council, I've been advocating to double the numbers of enforcement. And what I heard from most of the drivers, from the advocates, their market, their demand is mainly there. So I will be also there because I think that we have created unextended consequences. We have the bases in my district. I have a Simon car service, a Riverside car service, Audubon car service, Diamond car services. You know what happened to those drivers that as Uber was promoting in their marketing, you can make $5,000 if you move from those bases to here. Many of them been closing. Many of them, they went down from 500 to 150. So as a chairman, and getting a lot of heat from my liberal drivers in my community. I will be creating a balance. I will be advocating for the bailout in the type of the program that's being promoted. That's not popular among many other people. I will be advocating for to increase enforcement. I would believe that the way of how the, the area dedicated to the yellow today in the JFK in La Guardia, 65 million tour tourists, the percentage of tourists that use the yellow taxi, they should be, you know, we need to do more enforcement to protect them. So it's not a hiding thing because I say, I'm not a politician that tries to say what, pe what people would like to hear. I want to put something in the middle that balance, that improve the increase the value of the medallion, that working with the academic and think about different ideas because politicians, we don't know everything. We need to rely on the experience of the drivers with the medallion owners. And for me, it's not whoever owns 500 medallions. Those people, they have the best financial support. They have a group of investors. 
for me, the 6,000 individual medallion owner that they get into the mortgage to send the kids to college. That they get, sorry, the last thing, that they get into the loan to buy the houses. So I feel that we are in a place right now, again, where we need to continue working with all the sector. We need to level the playing field. There's no doubt that the way of how with the environment, the, the yellow, they had to provide the environment to study in order for the city to allow them to buy a medallion. And then we get all those dozen of bases, the black card, the Uber, and the Leaf, the B at the Juno, and the other 72 without being mandated to do the environment study. So that's a way of how you know, I've been conduct conducting myself, thinking about all the sector. The yellow as the first one, because for me, this is about justice. For me, it's about being for them, but I also will do my work. And yes, I will be advocating for deliberate basis to be able to provide the services in the community where the yellow, for the reason of, of they're not a demand there, they so need to continue so providing So thank you so much. There's a, at least one or two questions in, in the back. Do we have time? Okay. Comment <laughs> okay. for expressing your views on the what the city did to the taxi medallion industry. The city was our franchisor, and we were the taxi medallion industry was a franchisee, and they abandoned us. And that is wrong. It's just something going on that is really like, you know, like vague, that is widespread here. That is like something was taken away from the medallion industry, our franchise, our exclusive, and everybody is just kind of like accepting, accepting it as if it was like, okay, you know? But if we're gonna talk about enforcement, and what is really, really true about what they did to the taxi medallion industry. If a person is on the street looking at their phone and pressing a button and getting an Uber car, that's a street hail. No and ifs or buts about it. It's a street hail. So that was taken away from the medallion industry. <coughs> that right for a street hail, that's in state law. Most people who are not in the medallion industry here probably think, well, what is he talking about? That has nothing to do with street hail. But that's a street hail. That was a right that taxi medallions bought. And no one except medallion owners want to stand up and say, hey, that was ro that's wrong. That's a street hail. That's what we bought. And no matter how overwhelming it is to give it back to us, that should be done because they took something away from us. Okay, just like they took away the land of the Indians way back in the 1700s, and they never, they never reconciled that issue for hundreds of years, but they did wrong. We bought something, we bought a right, and the TLC used words to go around that right to make it legal for somebody else to do what we bought. And it's wrong, and this and and it has and this this thing is wrong, and it'll never be it'll never be right unless it's corrected. And that's all I want to Thank say. Thank you. I, I think that the the uh, yeah. <laughs> the person in the purple would like to raise a question. Yep. I suggest that. <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> I suggest that Uber and Lyft and everybody, all those companies be forced to buy a medallion for every single co car they own and have on the streets. What did you say? Hmm? I, said, <clears throat> I said Uber and Lyft and all the other companies should be forced to buy a medallion for every single car that they own. The company, not the people, the company should have to buy it. Is there, I, I just want to make sure that, is there anybody else who in the audience, I just, the one for a rule, uh, who has not asked a question yet that wants to? Yes, please. Um, I'd like to say that for five years we've been talking about symptoms, whether it's congestion or pollution or diminution of driver income. It's because there's too many cars on the road. The city council worked very hard to pass a so-called cap 
18 months ago. It hasn't worked. There's more cars on the road now than there was a year and a half ago. There's 115,000 for hired vehicles, 13,000 taxis. That's the reality. You cannot take away the law of supply and demand. And as far as what Councilmember Powers said about the demands, it's a false demand because the rides are subsidized by venture capital from Saudi Arabia, Russian oligarchs, and others, and that's why the rides were very cheap for a time. Actually, now you should know yellow taxi rides are cheaper than Uber rides. That happened you know, pretty recently. Um, as far as Uber's profits, I mean, I know Travis Kalanick made a lot of money, probably three and a half billion dollars, but the company itself lost 22 billion. What's that gonna look like when they get restructured in a bankruptcy? What are you gonna do with all these cars that are on the road? There's a reason, Charles, why there are only 13,000 medallions. It's because street space is limited. You can't have 115,000 cars on the road. You just can't. And nobody wants to deal with that. Um, you know, I wish that the um, amazing investigative uh, reporting resources that went into Brian Rosenthal's uh, articles that I referenced earlier, um, well, there's no reason it can't be done going forward. Or, or, you know, maybe Carolyn and other people in the audience, maybe you know this already and you should write it. Maybe you already have. I how, how, I, I know you do. Uh, and I see it and I value it. But how is it? How exactly did it happen that in 2014, 15, and 16, when the number of ride hail vehicles began to go up that S curve with that fabulous exponential growth. How was it that the state and the city just turned a blind eye? I, I mean, was it just that they were dazzled by the bullshit of you know, the digital economy and the gig economy? Were they so influenced by the lobbyists uh, of Uber and Lyft? Um, I mean, what actually happened to, uh, I mean, you know, maybe it doesn't make sense to sort of ask a negative because unfortunately the, the kind of default in government, even with people as energetic and idealistic and committed as uh, Council Member Rodriguez, um, but maybe, you know, the default is to just let stuff happen uh, and, oh, we'll fix it later. Well, it's much harder to fix now, but I have, I put out my idea for fixing it. Uh, that fellow at the back and this woman in the purple shirt, put out yours. I mean, we need these ideas, but more than that is that we need a, a political movement that is larger than just, and by saying just, I don't mean, and you know, for God's sakes, the New York Taxi Workers Alliance has been at the vanguard of all this, but this needs to become something even bigger, uh, and then the solutions are going to follow. And, and, and I agree with you, and, and that's one, you know, one thing that we, unfortunately, deal with in 2014. Uh, Uber used all those millions of dollars. And you know the council, unfortunately, we have a many council members that they were not ready to support what we were leading at that time. And, and, and when you started doing the tally and counting how many who are on board, you know, one of the things to say overall when, when the decision is not there, this is, you know, the, I like this idea, I like this proposal, but when it was time to, you know, to deal with, and you, and you remember those hearings, you remember those council members, my colleague, you know, who took the floor and they was all about, no, we cannot do this, we need to let it, you know, they, we need to be responsible to the consumer, and at that time, there was only like 75 cars, and it made me to believe that if I just look from the outside, Probably Uber will be fine, even, even if they lose 20,000 more. Because even today, if we we'll put things in perspective of where we are today and where we could be in 2014, they already got a window to increase, you know, to probably get their number. So, and that's why for me, like, when I look at the present and the future of the yellow or the, or the industry of the road, like, this is about how can we be helpful you know, to the drivers, to the individual medallion owners, and even to some people, because I've been, you know, advocating a lot for the 6,000 individual medallion owners. 
And this guy, Mr. Almonte, he coming from Riverdale. He lived there. I say, look, my wife and I put all the saving, and we own 10 medallions. So we are stuck between those who are the other uh, 9,000 and the others, and the others who are the individual medallion owners. So we also are the small, small business owner that they bought three medallions, that they bought five medallions, that no one is addressing, including that, as a top priority. So I feel, again, that, you know, a academic, expert, you know, have to help us to put together the best plan. Because this is not only about what is the right thing. This is about building the muscle, you know, to say we need to do the right thing. Because sometimes I feel that even at a moment we say, guy, let's put a press conference to fight for this. We've been getting like a two, three hundred people, and now a thousand of people that in the past they used to go there. And in 2014, we were trying to, you know, not only to establish the cap, but to pass all the bill. Yeah. Then we also got a lot of pushback, you know, from people sector that do business together, that they could have investment in the yellow but they also do insurance with the Uber. And they were able, you know, Uber was able to work with the other 74 app company and put together a coalition in 2014. And they defeat what we were trying to do at that time. We had never gave up. I believe that, you know, level the playing field, you know, to everyone will help us to be where we should be. As a city where the yellow, the six, the 15,000 medallion uh, cars that we have, the drivers, the liberal taxi drivers and the base owner, the corporate black car, they should be able to come back and have a good financial uh, uh, situation as they used to have it. I, I ended with this. What I heard from drivers and for advocates is that one of the top priority for them is if we enforce where most of the 65 million tourists stay, which is basically Midtown, down 96th Street, JFK and LaGuardia, if we enforce there, they feel that they will be able to get, if no passengers and riders, for them to be able to get a good return from, the, from their medallion investment and for the, for the drivers also to be able to make their living, to support themselves, support their family, and to support the New York City. There's no New York City without a yellow taxi. There's no out of, out, out, outside the out of border area without the library. Because you guys make what they face our city. So with that, let's continue working together. And I think that's a wonderful way to close this really wonderful discussion. I wanted to just say, take 30 seconds to say all the thank yous that I did not get to say at the outset, which is of course to our esteemed panelists, to all of you for coming out on a rainy day. And I also wanted to thank Harold, Shaima, Magda, and Mac, all the entire fantastic Roosevelt House staff for inviting us and bringing us all together into this magical house. I wanted to thank Lynn Ahn, whose idea this really was. Um, and of course, thanks to the president and the provost of Hunter College. Please join us upstairs for further conversation. We thank you. Thank you.